This video was brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Oh, getting too old for this. Hello, welcome to another video. And not just any video. This one you guys have been asking for specifically. You've been saying, hey Jason, when are you gonna do another tips and tricks video? Well, how about right now? So buckle up, because this one's a little random, gonna be bouncing all over the place, and you're just gonna have to hang on for the ride. Don't forget, subscribe down below, click the links, tools, Patreon page, if you wanna support me. Ugh. All right. Let's do it. Be quiet. Beware of the fox tonight. All right. Now, the question that some of you guys have been asking me is what is the best, safest way to cut small stock on the chop saw? Well, there's a couple different ways you could do it. The first thing you could do is you pull out your dust hose and you just tuck it back here in your pants like that. That way, when you poop your pants, because it's so sketchy, you're taken care of with the dust hose. But there's actually a better, safer way, and I'm gonna show you how right now. All right, now the, whoa. The easiest way to cut small stock on the miter saw is to make what's called a zero clearance miter saw fence. It's basically just an auxiliary removable mobile fence that you can slap on your miter saw and it'll help you cut small stock. Not only will it help you cut small stock, it'll just help you make cleaner cuts because you won't get all the blow up that you get on the normal miter saw. So I'm gonna show you how to make one super quick with just two pieces of wood. I'm gonna be using some CA glue and some regular glue and that got me thinking. Hey, maybe I could show you some tips for CA glue as well. Now, if you don't know what CA glue is, it's just what woodworkers call super glue to make other people feel inferior. I wish I was lying. It really is just super glue. And you can get all different brands. This is Starbond, whoever that is. But Tightbond makes some, a bunch of other companies make it. And the key with this is you want to get the glue and then they usually have an accelerator spray. This cuts down the wait time for it to dry because normal super glue takes 30 seconds and we're all lazy. Anyways, here's a few tips when you're using CA glue. Now the number one way that I use CA glue is usually to make jigs or hook calls onto things. Sometimes you use it for templating out things on the router. Now normally with the templates, you'd use double-sided tape to stick the template on top of your stock piece and run it through the router. But what if you don't have double-sided tape? Well, you can use CA glue and just regular blue painter's tape. So what you're gonna wanna do is take your template or piece that you wanna glue on, you put a piece of tape on there, you take another piece of blue tape and you stick it where you wanna glue it, you add some CA glue onto one side, accelerator spray onto the other side, and you press and hold. Okay, it's locked on there, as you can see, nice and secure. And then when you wanna get it off, well, you just pull, and because you taped it on there, it pops right up, it's nice and clean, you don't have to worry about a mess, and you're good to go. But there's another way that you can use CA glue that is also very helpful. So, to make our zero clearance miter saw fence, we're basically gonna have a base plate, a plywood. I like a nice wider one, however long as you want it. And then you need the back fence piece. We're gonna attach this here. Now you could just use regular old wood glue and clamp it up and wait. But like I said, woodworkers are lazy. So what I do is I'll put wood glue on here, 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 just sporadically. And then in between the wood glue, I'll use some CA glue. Now what this is gonna do is the CA glue is gonna dry much, much faster. And it essentially is gonna act like a clamp for our glue. So it's gonna hold 
the piece down while the glue dries. So we're just gonna slap that on there, wait the appropriate five seconds or whatever it takes. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, anyways. And now that's securely on there. And this is gonna get stronger and stronger as the wood glue then dries and you're gonna have a nice solid zero clearance fence. Now, let me show you how this works and how you can upgrade this to make it even better and more safe. All right, so this is how this essentially works. You just stick it on your miter saw and you can put your little piece there like this and hold it in place and then cut. And as you can see, because it's zero clearance, there's no chance of this little piece flipping back or getting away from you. But it's still a... <coughs> Sorry, I don't have my dust extraction on because you wouldn't be able to hear me. It's still a little scary because you do have to hold your hand pretty close to the blade. Now, I've been doing this forever. I know what the wood's going to do. I'm kind of comfortable with that. Probably shouldn't be. But if you're not comfortable with that, there's a little upgrade that you can do to this sled that will take your hand out of the equation and make it much easier. Let me show you what to do. All right, so the first thing you wanna do is just get a scrap piece of wood. This is just some scrap white oak. Now, as you can see on one end, I cut a nice steep angle, see like that. And then the other end, I just cut off each corner just to make it a little rounder like that. So what you're gonna do is take this piece of wood, stick it in your drill press or with your drill, whatever you're gonna do, and you're gonna drill a hole right in the end. Like that. Next, you're gonna take your little piece and you're gonna take a little strip of sandpaper. Now I just cut this out of a bigger piece and you're gonna glue it on to the end of your little piece here. Again, with some CA glue. I'm telling you guys, this stuff works wonders. Take your little piece of sandpaper and glue it right on there, okay? Beautiful, just like that. All right, then you're gonna take your piece of wood and you're gonna position it so that this flat edge is somewhat parallel, doesn't have to be perfect, to the bottom, okay? Something like that. And you're gonna take a drill and drill a hole through the back of your fence. Wunderbar. Then I'm just gonna take one of these threaded T-track little bolts here and you're gonna stick it through the back hook on your piece like that, and you're gonna tighten it down with this little turning knob nut thing, like that, okay? Now you got this rotating arm on there. All right, now, get your blade lined back up where it should go. Now that we got this little rotating arm on here, which is nice, because you can take this off, put it back on if it's in the way, so. You can lift this up. We got the sandpaper on the bottom there, which will give us extra grip. You can position your little piece and then back here, away from the blade, you can put pressure on this arm to hold down that little piece. You can cut like a half inch little sliver with this if you want, it's super easy. And then you just Look at that. Cut tiny little pieces all day long. It's super safe. Your hand is nowhere near the blade. And when you want this for a longer piece, you just undo this and pull it off. This is by far the easiest way to cut tiny pieces on the chop saw and keep all your fingers. All right, next tip. All right, the next tip I wanna talk about comes from another question that I get all the time down in the comment section. People wanna know, how do you determine grain direction? This is important because sometimes, whether you're hand planing or if you got an older planer that's knives instead of a helical head, it's important to know the grain direction so that you know which way to feed the board into the planer or which way to use your hand plane. There's an easy way to tell which way the grain is running in a board. Now, there are two sides of the board. There's the bark side. You wonder why it's called bark side. Well, it's the side that would have the bark on it. And then there's the heart side, the internal side of the tree. 
and the grain direction changes depending on whether it's the bark side or the heart side. So to determine the bark side, it's really easy. You look at the end of the board. See that there? See how the rings curve like that? Yeah, think of how a tree grows. The rings, okay, outside of the ring, that's the bark side. The inside of the ring, that's the heart side. Next thing you wanna look for are these cathedrals. See these big pointy shapes on the wood? Now some species it's easier to see these than others. This is a piece of pine, it's really easy, that's why I use this piece. But the, the cathedrals, they point this way. So if you're dealing with the bark side of the wood, the grain runs towards the tip of the cathedral, okay? Bark side, grain runs towards that tip of the cathedral. If you're dealing with the heart side of the wood, it's the opposite. They run from the bottom of the cathedral up towards the top, got it? Bark side towards the tip, heart side up from the bottom. It's really that easy. Hey, let's talk about expansion and contraction of wood for a second, all right? This is another one that you guys ask about all the time because I'm like, oh, we gotta do this to account for wood movement. Well, how does the wood move? Well, it expands and contracts. Oh, you wanna know more? Okay, anyways, it expands and contracts along the width of the board this way, seasonally, as the moisture content in the wood changes. The more moisture, the more it will expand, and then as the moisture leaves the board, it will contract back. Now, it will only expand across the width of the board. It will expand out, it'll contract back in. It does not expand and contract lengthwise. So, when you're building a piece of furniture, this is what you want to keep in mind. This is why it's not a great idea to take one board going this way and glue up another board going across it. Because this board's going to want to expand this way, that board's going to want to expand this way, and you can have a whole bunch of issues with your joinery. That being said, we break this rule all the time, okay? We do half lap joints that cross each other, we miter things together. It just is something to think about and err on the side of caution when you're designing and building a piece of furniture. There are certain things you just don't wanna do. For example, you don't wanna take a bunch of boards, glue them together this way, and then miter in a border, locking them in place. That will give them nowhere to expand and contract. I've seen many tables that are glued up with a solid border around them, and I guarantee it is only a matter of time until that's not gonna look so good. So expansion and contraction across the width of the board, it's something to know and think about when you're designing furniture. This video was sponsored by Squarespace. I don't think it's an exaggeration when I say that if there was one company that single-handedly changed the way I do business, it's Squarespace. They make it so easy to build your own website. You just go to squarespace.com, answer a few questions, pick the templates you want, and plug in all the pertinent information and pictures. I was very easily able to create my own website. It's beautiful, isn't it? They even make e-commerce easy by making it super simple to add products directly to your site where I can sell things like these stickers, river tables. Just say no, seriously. Come on, people. I'm also able to sell digital products like my plans that are also available on my website. Remember this Tambor nightstand? And they're even optimized for mobile devices. You don't even have to do anything. They're just automatically optimized. So here's what you're going to want to do. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash bourbonmothwoodworking to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I mean, it couldn't get any easier than that. All right. Trick number, I don't know, whatever number this is. Digital micrometers. These are great. You can measure things outside, you can measure things inside, but there is a secret unknown use for these that is my favorite use for these and probably the thing I use them for the most, which is splinter removal. Did you realize that these micrometers are the absolute best pair of tweezers in the entire world? They are perfectly flat on the end, okay? And they pinch to absolutely flush with each other. So when you've got splinters in your hand, 
you can really get in there and pull them out. And for an added bonus, you can see exactly what size splinter was plaguing your hand or foot or arm. I got one in the neck one time. Anyways, splinter removal. These things are a godsend. Well, hey, let's talk about a reclaimed wood hack, okay? I used to build a ton of stuff out of reclaimed wood. It's kind of how I got my start. And so you got to learn a few tips and tricks along the way. Now, one of the main things that helped me when I was using reclaimed wood was this. Now you got this nice board of reclaimed wood. It's got this cool old patina, which you want to save as much as possible. But then you cut the board in the middle and it's brand spanking new, crisp and clean, and it doesn't at all match the rest of your project. Well, there's a super simple way to fix this and it involves fire. After you've cut your board and you get your whole piece of furniture together and you've got some exposed ends that just look a little too nice and new, you're just going to take a butane torch and a lighter, turn the torch on like such, and just burn the ends of this a little bit. All right, that looks great, but hold on a second. We're going to make it even better. Then you just take a little sandpaper and lightly just hit the ends of it, okay? This is gonna smear everything together. Just like that. And now it looks 100 years old and your whole piece is gonna match. There you go. Now, here's a tip that you might already know, but it's super helpful, so I thought I'd err on the side of caution and show it to you anyways. Who knows? This might help somebody out there. Now, we've all probably been here where you're trying to install a cabinet door inside of a cabinet and you drill the holes and it's just a little bit off. But the amount that you need to move it is so slight that you can't move it because the next hole would be right next to the hole that you already drilled. So what do you do? Enter Q-tips. Huh? <laughs> you didn't think I was gonna say Q-tips, did you? Anyways, these Q-tips have this wooden shaft here. That's very important. It's got to be wood. You could also use matchsticks or just little tiny pieces of wood. Now, this is how this works. All right, let's say you drill a hole right here. But oh no, you need the next hole right next to it. But you can't put it right there because it's basically just going to connect the two holes. So you take your Q-tip with the wooden shaft or your matchstick and you cut the end off of it. Now you just got this nice little piece of wood. Then you're gonna take some glue, okay? And you're just gonna put a little on the end of the stick. Don't need a ton. And insert it into the hole, okay? Boom, just like that. Wipe up your glue, blah de blah Take a flush cut saw, get rid of it, sand it down, and now, you can drill your next hole right next to it and it'll still be nice and tight and nobody will know. They also work really good to clean out your ears. Just got to make sure you get all the glue off first. Well, hey, another question that you guys ask quite frequently is what is the easiest way to calculate board feet? Well, I'm glad you asked because there is a super simple way and you could learn the formula and the math and do it all on a piece of paper, but we live in the 21st century and that's a waste of time. So I'm going to show you the easiest way and it involves your smartphone. Now this is not a paid promotion. This is just what I use. So listen up here, bring it in close so you can see there is an app. Okay, you see it looks just like that. It's called Board Feet Easy. You pull it up and it's super easy to use. You enter the length, let's say 25 feet. You enter the width, let's say two inches. And you enter the thickness, let's go for eight quarter. And then you press calculate. It'll tell you exactly what your board feet are right there. You can even enter the price per board foot if you're at the lumber store and you know that. 
let's say that it's $13 because wood's a crazy expensive right now. You calculate that and now it's going to tell you you've got 8.33 board feet and it costs $108.33. I use this all the time when I'm buying lumber. Not only to calculate how much lumber I need, but also to double check that the people at the lumber store are actually charging me appropriately. I would say 50% of the time I end up correcting them on the total board foot process cost because I'm using the calculator and they're trying to do it in their head. So it'll save you money and it's super easy. Board feet easy. I'll try and put a link in the video description. Again, not sponsored. There comes a time in every young boy's life. Nope, that's probably sexist. There comes a time in every woodworker's life that they need to use what is called a sacrificial fence. Now, I think I talked about sacrificial fences in my table saw tips and tricks video, which if you haven't watched, you can do so right there. Anyways, and that's where you put a fence on next to your fence that is a sacrificial fence so that you can move the fence all the way up until it is literally touching the blade, if not a little past, so that you can just skim the side of things. You can cut right up against your fence. Now it's called a sacrificial fence because it keeps your real fence from getting all eaten up by the blade. Now the way that I used to do sacrificial fences was I would just clamp them on like this, hold them down, and run my stuff through, which works great, except that these clamps, they can kind of get in the way depending on what it is that you're cutting. Enter the new thing that I found that have been around for a long time. I just, I didn't know, I didn't know. Which are these universal fence clamps from Rockler. These things are sweet. You basically take your sacrificial fence, you drill a few holes in it, and then you just plop these in place. You put one there, clamp it down, like so. Put another one up here, clamp that down. Now, not only is your fence way more secure like this, you don't have to worry about those clamps being in the way, so you can use the entire side of the fence. I would just say when you're doing this to make sure that you put the clamps before or after the blade. You don't want them anywhere the blade is because if you move that fence over too much, well, you're gonna cut into your clamps and that wouldn't be good. So these Rockler Universal Fence Clamps, they're awesome for sacrificial fences. I will put a link in the video description. Oh, I'm getting tired, too much running. All right, this next trick is pretty simple, but I'm gonna show it to you anyways. I actually picked this one up when I was over at my buddy Keith Johnson's house, KJ Sawdust, Keith Johnson, Fine Woodworking. I forget what his channel is exactly named, but I will link it somewhere up there. Anyways, whenever you have to trace out one piece onto another piece to cut a through mortise and tenon or to do butterflies or to do dovetails, whatever it may be, you put the piece on there and then usually you use a razor blade or a line knife, anything like that, anything pointy and sharp. And you take the knife and you run it along the edge. Now, what everybody wants to do, what I always wanted to do, was push as hard as you possibly can so you get a really nice pronounced line that you can get your chisel on. The problem with that is, when you push really hard, the knife is gonna wanna follow the little grains and fibers in the wood. So if you're pushing really hard, there's a chance that you're gonna skew away from that line and out because you're not in as much control. So what you're actually gonna wanna do is put the block down and then take the knife and ever so slightly, just barely run it along. Now, you're gonna increase pressure every time you go along, but because you're slowly starting that score line, it's gonna be a perfect line right up against your stock piece. Don't try and muscle it in there as hard as you can. That's what morons like me do. Thanks, Keith. Well, there you have it. Another tips and tricks video for your enjoyment. Hopefully, you got at least something out of that video. Make sure to subscribe down below if you liked what you saw. Heck, even if you hated it, just subscribe. It would really help me out. Also, there are links in the video description. 
to all the tools and supplies I used in this video, as well as a link to my website for merchandise, t-shirts, motivational posters, plans, and a link to my Patreon page if you'd like to support the channel and be able to watch all these videos early without ads. That's a pretty good deal. All right, enough links. I'm gonna sleep on the floor.